Please be seated. I want to welcome everyone uh, to the Military Personnel Subcommittee hearing on the state of the military, state of the military service personnel system, systems as we enter the fiscal year uh, 2018 budget season. Our panel of the, of the service personnel chiefs is here to address each of their services personnel postures, including personnel policies for recruiting and retention, family programs, and to address budget and legislative requests for fiscal year 2018 to the extent that they can. Today's focus is on the personnel policies the services currently have to sustain and create efficiencies in which includes promotion policy, bonus and incentive policies, and in-strength changes that still need to be examined in light of proposed increases and the ensuing challenges. I'm especially interested in your plans for retention of the right service members that are central to your mission and what may develop into difficult recruiting and retention in, in, into a difficult recruiting and retention environment in the coming years. We'd like to understand the policies and programs that will be used to maintain and increase personnel in strengths. Before I introduce our panel, let me offer Congressman Speer an opportunity to make any opening remarks. Uh, Ms. Speer. Mr. Chairman, thank you, and thank you to all of our witnesses who are here today. This is a critical time to hear from you. The services have spent the past several years implementing end strength reductions. Before we commit to growing the force again, we need to take a very good look beyond just the numbers. Because for each and every new service member that commits to military service, we are signing the government up for a lifelong commitment to them as well. A commitment that will come with a significant cost. I'm interested in hearing how the services are going to compete in an increasingly competitive labor market and retain the skilled individuals they invest in while still operating in a constrained budget environment. In the past, recruiting challenges have been addressed by lowering standards, a tactic I do not support and presume you do not at all, as well. But simply adding manpower will not address the personnel challenges of today and tomorrow. We also need to focus on retention, quality of life, and fostering a culture of respect for all service members. These are areas in which I believe current efforts are insufficient. Skilled women and men are abandoning the military in response to a persistent plague of harassment, assault, and degradation. Further cuts to family programs and housing allowances run counter to trends in the private sector, providing even more enticement to leave. We also need to think creatively about how the services manage people. I'm interested in hearing how the services are going to transform their personnel management policies to better manage and retain talent. There have been many proposals over the past few years, and many of these initiatives can be accomplished internally without changes in law, but will most likely require a cultural shift, which has always seemed to be the biggest challenge. I understand that this may be General McConville's last hearing as the Army's personnel chief, and that he may be moving up. Um, thank you for all you've done as Army's G1, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses. Thank you, Ranking Member Speer. Um, let me welcome our panel. Uh, let me welcome our panel, Lieutenant General James McConville, uh, Deputy Chief of Staff, G1 United States Army. Additionally, I'd like to also congratulate General McConville on his nomination to be the United States Army's Vice Chief of Staff. Vice Admiral Robert Burke, uh, Chief of Naval uh, Personnel, United States Navy. Uh, Lieutenant General Mark Bilakis, uh, Deputy um, Chief of Staff uh, for Manpower, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> Uh, Deputy Commandant for Manpower and Reserve Affairs, United States Marine Corps. Uh, Lieutenant General uh, Gina Grosso, Deputy Chief of Staff for Manpower, Personnel, and Services, United States Air Force. Uh, General McConville, you are now recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, sir. And uh, Chairman Kaufman, Ranking Member Speer, distinguished members of the committee, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to, be, to appear before you on behalf of the United States Army. I have submitted a statement for the record, but I would like to highlight a couple of points. 
Now, the Army's people, our soldiers, our civilians, our retirees, veterans, and families are our greatest asset. They are our greatest weapon system. And there's a continued need for a ready force, one that is fully manned, fully equipped, and trained, is evidenced daily by the international events. Predictable and time, timely funding, funding are key to manning the Army and accomplishing our missions. We thank you for the increase in end strength of 28,000. That will improve our readiness, ensure that the Army has better manned formations. I want to thank you um, for all you've done. And as we move into the future, you asked about talent management. We are moving from a personnel management system to a modern talent management system that will allow us to more effectively manage all three components of the Army. Diversity is important to the Army. Through our outreach and marketing efforts, we are increasing the diversity of our force in underrepresented branches and occupations. We're committed to giving all soldiers the opportunity to serve in what every military occupation they can meet the standards are. Currently, all military occupations are open to women, and women serve in every battalion in the active Army. We remain focused on personal resiliency and suicide prevention with world-class programs for our soldiers, civilians, and families, and we are aggressively working to decrease the stigma associated with seeking behavior health care. Sexual assault and sexual harassment have no place in our ranks and diminish our readiness. Our recently published Workplace and Gender Relations Survey Active Duty Members shows a decrease in prevalence and increase in reporting, but there is much work to be done. At the end of the day, the Army's people, the men and women who serve our country today, along with their families, and all those are vital to the security of our nation. I thank you for your continued support of the all-volunteer Army and look forward to your questions. Chairman Kaufman, Ranking Member Speer, and distinguished members of this committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you to discuss Navy manpower, personnel, training, education, and family support programs. I'm honored to represent the men and women in the United States Navy. For 240 years, the Navy has been a cornerstone of American security and prosperity. Now more than ever, the Navy is important to national security, and so are its people. As Chief of Naval Personnel, I am responsible for ensuring our ships, squadrons, submarines, and stations are fully manned with sailors who are ready to undertake the many jobs and tasks we ask of them. This responsibility includes finding and recruiting talented individuals as well as executing training pipelines that transform sailors into highly skilled maritime warriors. While the Navy has healthy recruiting, retention, and manning today, it is vital we update policies that position us to deal with challenges before we are confronted with a crisis. As with the weapons systems we use, we must continue to refresh our personnel system to keep pace with the rapidly changing world. And we must do so with a sense of urgency. Our workforce must be poised to adapt quickly to new and evolving threats as we continue to work to attract and retain the very best sailors in an increasingly competitive talent market. We will continue to evaluate our policies, practices, delivery systems, and when appropriate, we will pursue additional avenues with your help to improve readiness and also to provide sailors choice and flexibility. Sailor 2025 is an effort we began a few years ago and is a roadmap to help us do just that. Today, it consists of about 45 different initiatives aimed at modernizing our personnel management and training systems to more effectively recruit, train, and manage our force while also improving the Navy's warfighting readiness. At the foundation of these initiatives is an effort to streamline and optimize our organizational processes. Today, our success greatly depends upon the extraordinary efforts of sailors and Navy civilians working tirelessly to overcome an aging personnel business model in a non-coherent and manually intensive family of 55 personnel IT systems. That is why we are transforming the way we operate, leveraging modern commercial IT capabilities and practices that will help us improve fleet readiness and customer service to our sailors reducing operating costs and helping us to manage our organizational data and programs. Ultimately, this transformation is intended to holistically improve the way we manage sailors' careers and deliver personnel readiness to our Navy. I look forward to working with you as we build the Navy of tomorrow together, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. 
Thank you. Chairman Kaufman, Ranking Member Speer, distinguished members of the subcommittee, it is my privilege to appear before you to discuss your Marine Corps. Marines are the foundation of the Corps. They are the service's most critical resource and always will be. Your Marines are recruited, educated, trained, and retained to win our nation's battles. Everything we do in the Marine Corps must contribute to their readiness and their ability to win in battle. Overall, Marine Corps recruiting and retention remains strong. Our recruiters continue to find high quality men and women of character who want to take up the challenge to be United States Marines. We will make our recruiting mission this year and we'll have a start pool for next year above 50%. Over 99% of those who we will ship will be tier one traditional high school graduates or the equivalent. We thank you for the increased and strength author authorization in last year's NDAA that takes us to 185,000 in the active component. This increase serves to enable our retaining critical warfighting capabilities while improving information-related capabilities and capacities necessary in an increasing, increasingly dynamic operating environment. Along with the other services, the Marine Corps is diligently preparing for the new blended retirement system that goes into effect on January 1st. This new system represents the most significant change in military compensation in many years. So the financial education of each Marine is a priority. To this end, we have implemented, implemented an integrated communications plan to increase awareness. I have personally discussed the BRS at major installations with our leaders and recently spoke to our prospective commanders course about the challenge of preparing over 184,000 Marines in both the active and the reserve component for this important opt-in decision during 2018. We must get this right. Thereafter, we will closely be monitoring the BRS for any unintended consequences, including those affecting retention. Your Marines are proud of what they do. They are proud of the Eagle Globe and Anchor and what it and each Marine represents to our nation. With your continued support, a vibrant Marine Corps will be ready to meet our nation's call. Thank you again for the opportunity to present this testimony, and I look forward to your questions. Chairman Kaufman, Ranking Member Speer, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to deliver the Air Force personnel posture for fiscal year 2018. America's Air Force is always there, providing global vigilance, global reach, and global power to combatant commanders around the world. However, being always there comes at a cost to equipment, infrastructure, and most importantly, our airmen. Sustained global commitments and continued budgetary uncertainty have diminished our ability to successfully balance capability, capacity, and readiness. Simultaneously, the Air Force experienced increased demand in enduring missions and growth in new mission sets such as cyber, remotely piloted aircraft, information surveillance and reconnaissance, and special operations. The Air Force is currently facing three distinct personnel challenges. First, the need for increased end strength to support current mission requirements. Second, the national pilot crisis, and finally meeting the quality of life and quality of service needs of our airmen and their families. Our first challenge is obtaining the end strength the Air Force needs to support current mission requirements. We're grateful for the congressional support to increase FY17 active duty end strength levels to 321,000 airmen. Even with this increase, Air Force readiness depends on responsible growth in fiscal year 18 to a requested total force end strength level of 675,000 airmen. This growth is necessary to support current operations. Our second challenge is the national pilot crisis. As you are aware, we discussed the pilot shortage at length in our March 29th hearing. I will just add to that discussion that we are meeting with several airline senior executives tomorrow to seek ways to collabor collaboratively address the national pilot shortage. The third challenge to note today is ensuring we meet the quality of life and quality of service needs of our airmen and their families. Our force readiness depends on a strong, resilient force. We are increasing resiliency skills programs by adding installation resilience trainers, evaluating military family needs, and ensuring airmen exposed to combat and traumatic events receive needed care. Unfortunately, working against our resiliency efforts is any form of interpersonal or self-directed violence to include sexual assault and suicide. Any number of incidents is one too many. Additionally, violence is not always physical, as forms of violence have bled into social media. Since my testimony on this to this committee on the Air Force's social media policies, the Chief of Staff chartered a working group to evaluate the policies in place for appropriate conduct online and via social media. New guidance is currently in coordination. This guidance will be punitive and will be completed and issued in the next 60 days. 
As we move beyond our immediately challenges, we're planning and preparing for the future. To do this, the Air Force established a comprehensive human capital strategy across six lines of effort to address talent planning, talent acquisition, talent development and utilization, talent evaluation, compensation and retention, and finally transition. Our talent management strategy focuses on best leverage the abilities of our total force airmen, maximize efficiencies, and increase human performance to produce warfighters and leaders for the Air Force and Joint Force. To further our strategy, we established a talent management innovation cell to rapidly identify and deploy initiatives within existing authorities. As this team produces policies and programs to better attract and retain talent, we will work with our service partners in the Office of the Secretary of Defense to present options to Congress to modify or add authorities as needed. Our talent management strategy would not be possible without the support and authorities Congress has already given us. For example, we're using the Career Intermission Program Authority to provide career flexibility to our airmen and their families. Additionally, the Air Force is grateful for con congressional support and continuation of direct hire authorities to hire talented civilian airmen directly from our universities, expand the access of professionals for our depots, and increase hiring speed to bolster our cyber mission forces. We also appreciate the authority granted for expanded parental leave and the first aviation bonus increase in 18 years. The increased bonus will help alleviate our pilot crisis by retaining more pilots after their initial active duty service commitments. Thank you for allowing me to cover our current personnel challenges today and share with you how we are preparing for the future. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, General Grosso. Uh, first question uh, to uh, uh, the Army, uh, uh, Lieutenant General McConville. I am uh, concerned, and I think the Oversight and Investigation uh, uh, Subcommittee for the House Armed Services uh, Committee looked at this issue, and that is uh, in, in Afghanistan force management levels and that what uh, the uh, combatant commander was quite frankly forced to do was kind of work with those numbers and in working with those numbers they uh, display like uh, for instance uh, helicopter units uh, they displace the enablers of the maintenance personnel uh, with civilian contractors uh, I believe at a higher co not only at a higher cost but really in a, I think compromising the, the technical skills of those uh, enablers that didn't have the uh, airframes to work on while they were in Afghanistan. But so what they did, so the objective was if you only, they only allowed so many uniform military personnel to, suppl to, to supplant those, some of those uniform military personnel with contractors. I think we need a policy of, of what we're really not gonna do uh, in terms of uh, enablers. Uh, uh, maybe the, the, the policy was simply wrong to begin with, but I wonder if you can reflect on that. Well, I can as far as, I think it's absolutely critical uh, that we train the entire force. So having commanded aviation units, uh, actually, you know, people tend to focus on the pilots, but the maintainers, the people that fix the helicopters, the people that, refu that refuel those helicopters, if they don't deploy with you, you need to make sure that they're getting the training someplace else because if not, those aircraft will not fly. And when you return from that deployment, the pilots uh, redeploy from that deployment, you will not have a unit that's ready to go to combat. So I think it's very, very important that if the troops did not deploy with all their enablers, those enablers have the opportunity to get the training, and that's what we're doing right now. Sure, and I guess that's at our policy level to say, you know, it's simply wrong uh, to send uh, those, uh, those aircraft frames uh, without the enablers, uh, you know, to it's simply because we're trying to to show the American people that our numbers, our troop numbers are down, uh, when the reality is we're just substituting uniform military personnel for higher priced contractors in a war zone. And so I just think that's inappropriate. And I, I think one thing that this subcommittee will take a look at is where do we draw the line uh, in terms of what's inappropriate for a civilian contractor to do versus uh, a uniform military. I'd like to hear from each one of you. Uh, so many times I think we talk more about the officer's side uh, of the equation, but on the enlisted side, uh, what is the um, uh, a, a critical uh, career field that that it's difficult to? I I, I think accessions are not a problem. I, I'm assuming, but to retain in terms of retention, what would be a career field in your respective branch of service that is difficult in terms of retention on the enlisted side? Um, why don't we start with you, General Grosso? 
Um, sir, on the enlisted side, we have actually unprecedented retention with the exception of five career fields that we're following closely. Cyber defense, battlefield airmen, which is our PJs, our Siri, our TACPs, um, intelligence, um, explosive ordnance disposal, and then select nuclear enterprise specialties. And this is on the retention side? This is on the retention side, okay. yes, sir. Uh, and we use the tools that you've given us, selective reenlistment bonuses, um, career status retention bonuses, um, things that we can do in the assignment process, giving more flexibility, more say in the assignment process, um, watching family issues to understand if there's some family challenges there. Um, but, it, but we have over 200 enlisted specialties, um, so this is a small subset that we're not- What's the most critical out of the five? The you know, we actually don't, we don't have a way to, to we don't rank okay. these one to five. We don't think of it that way. All of, we don't have enough, we're not retaining enough of these specialties to sustain the force, and we focus on all of these to fix um, individually. Okay. General Brilakis. Sure, thanks. Uh, we have some fields. Uh, cyber. Okay. Some intel fields, human counter intel. Um, those have been challenged with retentions. Um, Part of the challenge, some of our MOS, especially in the cyber, are what we call lat move MOSs. So we take junior Marines from various MOSs okay. and meeting those requirements uh, because very, very technical, very difficult training. Uh, there are incentives that we use to attract those individuals. And we're taking a look at how we've contracted them in the past and how we'll do it in the future, whether we finish the training, get your certification, and then you serve out your contract length. So there are a number of different MOSs uh, in the combat arms. We're doing very well. Uh, in the aviation community, we're doing very well. Retention, so okay. We are, it's really in those, in those, high, in those low, low density, high demand MOSs and some of the more highly technical MOSs sure. where we're having some retention challenges. We use the SRVs and um, we have in the past used an operating, what we call an op four kicker. Okay. Vice Admiral Burke. Yes, sir, uh, for uh, the, the Navy, uh, our, our number one challenge is, uh, continues to be uh, the, our nuclear trained uh, enlisted ratings. Uh, and then uh, a very close uh, uh, tie there would be the uh, linguists and the cryptology specialists, almost identical, uh, you know, vocational aptitude requirements, uh, you know, required both for recruiting uh, nukes and, uh, and the linguists. So they're, they're both a recruiting challenge and a retention challenge. Uh, and then on the retention front, uh, number three and four after that would be the cyber offense and defense and then uh, all the advanced electronics fields. And, and we're managing all of those uh, retention-wise with the SRBs. We are having to start to ratchet those numbers back up. Thank you. Lieutenant General McConnell. Uh, cy cyber oh. is huge. We're training okay. these kids, give them incredible capabilities. And, and then we start to get into the languages and, and mm -hmm. cryptology type things where um, they're very marketable to other organizations. And, okay. And so. Okay. Uh, Ranking Member Spear. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses again. I'm trying to get a handle on the 2017 NDAA. Lieutenant General McConville, the Army had an addition of how many? Was it 16,000? It's 16,000, ma'am, in the uh, active. It's 28,000 total. So uh, Reserve uh, had, the National Guard had an increase of 8,000, and the Reserve had an increase of 4,000. Okay, and the Navy, Vice Admiral? Uh, we were nearly uh, flat. Flat. Marines? Ma'am, we had a 3,000 uh, 3, person increase in the active component, none in the reserve component. Okay. Air Force? Uh, Ma'am, 4,000 in the active component and a steady state in the rest. Okay. So um, let's start with you, um, General McConville. It appears that you were originally going to have to reduce your strength by some 16,000 or 15,000, and then all of a sudden it reversed to an increase of 16,000. Um, how did you accomplish that, and what's the cost associated with that? Well, we, we were on, we, when we started the year, I'll talk about the active force, it was 475,000 starting the year, and we were on a path to reduce the active component to 460,000. So we, we were basically gonna, if, if nothing happened, if the NDA, uh, 17 didn't come out, we would have reduced the Army by 15,000. The authorization we got was 476, so it, it stopped the, the reduction, the drawdown, but the Army is coming down, so all the systems were set to bring the Army down. So what we're doing is, is we're, we're in a drawdown, and now we're reversing that drawdown, and we are, um, what we did was we went ahead and increased 
our enlistments by 6,000. We retained 9,000 more soldiers in the field, and we increased our officer accessions by 1,000 to get that 16,000. Okay. Vice Admiral Burke, any, uh, you didn't have, you were flatlined. Okay. Uh, Lieutenant General Lacus. Uh Yes, ma'am. We were 202,000 at the height of uh, at the height of our end strength, and we were coming down to some 20,000. There was an, uh, we got down to we were heading down to 182,000. We did that over the course of four years. Uh, then Commandant Dunford requested a one-year extension to stay at 184,000, and so where we found ourselves was a little bit below 184,000. The Congress. Um, uh, gave us the additional 3,000, and so we were going to meet that by assessing 2,000 additional Marines. Uh, and then, uh, and we've been very clear: we're not going to, we are not going to compromise on quality. And so we will, we will make the rest of it up in the coming year because the law came later in the year, and the money came even later. Uh, we did not want to do any retention actions that would compromise quality. Okay, uh, Lieutenant General Grazo. Uh, Ma'am, we hit a low in FY15 of, of 311,000. So we had the big push in FY16 where we grew to 317,000. And to do that, we had to put some additional resources into the recruiting effort, um, pe both people and dollars. Uh, but we had the capacity in our training infrastructure. So I could have, I'd, I'd get to the dollar cost of that. Okay. So advertising, how much is spent on advertising for each of your services? Uh, about, 200, about $230 million. Advertising? For marketing, for total marketing. Wow. Okay. Navy? Yeah. Ma'am, we've been on a uh, declining trend. Uh, uh, 17's budget is uh, $47 million. That's uh, down from uh, $56 million the two years prior. Okay. Uh, the, the ideal requirement is $100 million. The fact is we're, we're budgeted about $82 million this year. Okay. We're about 100, 110 million for um, advertising. Okay, so if we add you all up together, we're looking at close to what four and a, 450 million dollars, give or take. Um, how do we measure the value? Well, I mean, because you advertise at NASCAR, how do we know someone? What do we? What are the deliverables from that? Well, for, what we have is we have metrics uh, that we, we look at, and, and, and some of the metrics include um, how many people that were not favorable towards maybe serving the military. By the basis of advertising, we, we track influences, how many people are favorable, how many um, people come on to our Go Army um, social media, and then we track the, the investment of those dollars and the return on how many leads we get of young men and women that want to actually come into the Army. So in, in politics today, um, you know, the cost of advertising is very high, whether it's um, print or um, TV. And, and there's a whole movement to uh, social media, which is much cheaper. Um, so I'm curious to what extent my time is, is uh, out, so maybe over the second round we can talk about it. It seems like we would be much better served, take that money, put some of that into social media, and um, reduce what we're spending on some of these boutique um, operations that we have going on. And it sounds like basically from most of you, with the exception of Lieutenant General uh, Grosso, that you're not, you're not having any problem filling these, these vacancies. It, it appears some of the issues are around retention, particularly in cyber and intelligence, but we can address that second round. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fear. Mr. Bacon, you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you. I want to thank each of you for your leadership, and I think you each have a tough job, and I think Congress owes each of the services better. We've, we've uh, raised money, we've cut money, we've done sequesters, we've done CRs, and that always impacts how many people we have in each of the services. And after three years of experience myself, uh, the people are at the end of that whip going up and down, and, and I think we owe you more stability, more predictability. Uh, so we're going to work hard to do that. I want to ask each of you, what is the number one reason for an officer in your service, the number one reason for an enlisted in your service to decide to get out early? And I just want to see what we can learn from it. And I'll just start off with uh, General McConville. 
I think many come in um, to serve. What we're seeing is they're taking the opportunities, they're taking the training, they want to serve their country, and they, you know, they take, um, they want to live the American dream. You come in, you serve your country for a tour. That's what we'd like them to do. They take the GI Bill, they go off, get to college, raise a family, and what we want them to do is become soldiers for life, and go out there and hire our vets in their in occupations, and also inspire other young men and women to serve. And what we've found is 79 percent of our recruits that come in the Army have a family member that serves. So we've kind of tasked them to do that. Thank you, Admiral Burke. Sir, I'd say it's, a, it's the same thing for the Navy. Uh, you know, whether they, uh, they, they stay in for a career in the active uh, component or they go and affiliate with the reserves or go on and be a, a great uh, citizen and advocate for the Navy uh, in, in society. Uh, you know, s some folks uh, come in to get, get an education. They come in to, to grow up and learn about themselves, uh, set themselves up for another walk in life. Uh, some folks don't uh, necessarily uh, agree with the long periods of family separation and, and, and deployment life uh, that the seagoing service has. So that's I did, that's I probably did one tour on the Carl Vinson, and I can speak. That yeah. was that's the, that was an no, experience for the airmen. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Thirty-nine years ago, I, I I signed I signed on with the intention to serve for three years. Mm -hmm. I was going to go be a captain of industry with my business degree. And here I am uh, after two, to, two times where I actually thought about leaving the service, but I decided. Someone did a bait and switch on you somehow. That's right, sir. 75% <laughs> um, of every mm -hmm. annual cohort that we recruit will leave the service. Right. With, with two-thirds of the Marine Corps in the operating forces, it's a young force, and we have no place to put everybody in the career force. We have youngsters that join the Marine Corps to do just that, join the Corps, prove themselves, join the team. Um, whether they join to fight, in the last decade or where they're joining to serve as they're doing now, uh, those individuals join the Marine Corps to get that experience, to be that Marine. We try to mold them and send them back to be good citizens. But we've got a lot of folks who've got a plan in life, and the Marine Corps is part of that plan, and staying in the Marine Corps is not part of that plan. Right. Uh, and I think I can say the same thing for our officers. Thank you. General Grosso? I think the number one reason they we, they tell us is separation from family. Yeah. So when you're at that point where you're, either your enlistment is up or your officer doesn't have a commitment, um, they evaluate their situation and the, their predictability mm -hmm. to be separated and make a decision. This is my own personal experience. I think when the family member said they've had enough, it's hard for the active duty member or guard or reserve to stay in. Uh, normally we're having a good time, you know, enjoying ourselves or the morale, the mission inspires us. But when the family said they've had enough, it's, it's hard to stay in. I would also let me just point out, I, my experience has been when we feel like we're part of an elite service with modern equipment, great training, people want to be a part of the elite. But when we've cut training, have 25-year-old uh, equipment, that also undermines our, re our retention. So one other question um, for my time here. What is the rates of your non-deployable uh, folks? I think we're growing. It's, I'm, I'm hearing anecdotally anyway, that some of the services, that number is growing, which means it's falling on fewer and fewer people, which means then they have more health problems and becomes a cycle. Uh, are you seeing the trends growing for your non-deployables for health reasons, and should we f fix that somehow? General McConville. Well, in the Army, we're, we're about 10% non-deployables. We're actually come down from the, from the peak of the war. Uh, we were running probably about 14 to 15%. Um, what we're doing is, is really at every phase of, of when we bring soldiers in. Um, we put an occupational physical assessment test, so you, you have to get in shape before you start initial, initial military training. And then when you come to initial, initial military training, um, if you're not ready to start, we, we get you in shape there. And when you come to the unit where he's putting physical therapists in the unit, because what we're finding is musculoskeletal injuries are the biggest cause of, of, of soldiers being non-deployable, and we've got to work them through the whole cycle to make that happen. Admiral Burke. Yeah, in a Navy of about 335,000 active component uh, folks, we, we have uh, a little less than 2,000 that are non-deployable because of legitimate medical uh, issues. And then we've got about 18,000 that are overdue for their dental exams. And uh, that's something that, that we continuously work on. We're uh, in the midst of changing our program for our uh, uh, overseas and sea duty screening to make it on par with our physical fitness program, put the onus on the individual that it has to be done at certain periodicities. And uh, so we're, we're changing that, uh, that paradigm. And then the only other factor is uh, 
operational uh, holds for uh, sea duty uh, for uh, pregnant women. But very, very low numbers. Thank you. I know I'm out of time, Chairman, Mr. Chairman, but hopefully they can, maybe the last two could answer the question. If sure. I defer to you. Um, yeah, okay. go ahead and finish the. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, sir, you've got, you've got a couple different types of non deployables those in the brig, those in the hospital, those that are in the uh, integrated disability evaluation system, et cetera. You have, those are kind of the long-term long -term, non deployables and then you have the, the, the short-term, those that go to the hospital, get a surgery, come back, rehabilitate, and come in and out. I can't give you the exact numbers. They are they're something that we track. I have to brief the commandant on them quarterly and explain to them as far as that goes. We have done, we've taken effort steps to reduce the backlog in the disability evaluation system, and we're making progress as far as that goes. We've got just over 2,000 Marines in that particular process. Uh, it's, that's a com it's a complex question, uh, but uh, I'd, be happy, I'd be happy to uh, have that discussion with your staff offline. Myself as well, I do not bring that data with me, but I'll be happy to get that to you. Uh, that's right. Ms. Songus, you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon to our witnesses. Uh, I, I appreciate the chance to talk with each of you today about the military services recruitment efforts, and in particular, I have an interest in the importance of recruiting more women into the armed forces. Readiness depends, up, and meeting all the needs that you all have, uh, depends upon the ability of the services to take advantage of the talent pool across all segments of society, and this is particularly true when it comes to leveraging the talents of women as they constitute half of our citizenry and are proportionately underrepresented in all the services. So with this in mind, um, the, I'd like to ask all of you, the most recent report of the Defense Advisory Committee on Women in the Service, Dakowitz, notes that some of the services have instituted, quote, credible, meaningful accession goals for women, unquote, in connection with integration of women into previously closed combat arms, military occupational specialties, and units. So I'd like to ask each of you, have you set such goals? Uh, and if you have, how you have adapted your recruitment strategies to meet those goals? Well, for the Army, as, as far as go, I just like to say, we have 170,000 women in the United States Army right now, which is, when you think, that is a, a significant portion of the force. Uh, we have women serving in every infantry, armor, and artillery battalion in every brigade combat team in the Army. And uh, we're seeing as we've opened up all the occupations, the women, many more women are serving. We're seeing places like West Point where I was the second class with women at West Point uh, when I went in 1981. We're running probably five or six percent. We're seeing rates of 24 percent in the classes coming in. So we're seeing uh, an increase. We have not set exact goals, but in the field and uh, at recruiting, we are actively recruiting women, and we need to because they're high quality. And as we grow the army, we are not going to reduce the standards. So we need high quality women and high quality everyone to come into the army. Admiral Burke. Yes, ma'am. Today, the the uh, Navy is at 18 percent women. Uh, the last uh, three years, we've exceeded 25% uh, uh, women enlisted accessions. This last year was uh, almost 27%. The Naval Academy uh, graduating class this year will be uh, almost 27%. Uh, for us, it's become a, a readiness issue with uh, technical graduates, uh, numbers of women with uh, technical degrees growing, and the number of technical degrees that we rely on to do the jobs that, that we have in the Navy. So it's an increasing readiness issue. Uh, we've uh, uh, drastically increased the uh, mixed gender representation in our uh, recruiting uh, material. Uh, last year that uh, included shifts in uh, what we do for uh, special warfare and in including uh, things that we do uh, out in the field when we represent our, what we call our warrior challenge rating. So that's SEAL, special uh, warfare, combat crews, uh, EOD divers, uh, and then uh, we send out a lot of female representatives for public events and, and things of that nature. And then the submarine force as well, uh, we, we're doing uh, quite well in, in that area. So uh, progress. And then uh, in terms of uh, where we're, what roles we're moving those women into, which occupational specialties or ratings as we call them in the Navy, uh, we're moving them into 
uh, you know, fields that had been traditionally underrepresented by women, increasingly moving them into technical fields uh, and uh, increasingly, uh, they're becoming increasingly comfortable in those fields that had been uh, previously underrepresented by women. So uh, we need them in those fields. We need them to do those jobs. General Brilakis. Representative Songs, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> we have no specific quota for women other than more right now. Uh, the Commandant has put us on a trajectory to increase the number of females represented in the Marine Corps. Uh, the initial goal is 10 percent. That's maximizing the existing infrastructure that we have um, for our recruit training. Uh, I owe him an answer at the end of the summer on a plan to take to go to the next particular level as far as that goes. Uh, accompanying that that direction was decisions to improve the quality of the young ladies that we bring into the Marine Corps. We have seen an increase in their in, uh, intelligence scores their physical fitness scores. Um, we have uh, seen a reduction in the attrition at recruit training, uh, and all those point to a, a direction that recruiting command has taken the drive toward quality seriously. Um, within, I think your question was really kind of focused on quotas in the, in the integration of our, our previously closed units. We don't have any quotas. We don't have quotas for our male Marines. Every individual that comes in to join the Marine Corps, we ask them what they want to do, and we try and fit that to what, what they're trying to aspire to. And General, do I have a few minutes for General Grasso to answer, Mr. Chairman? Yeah. Uh, Ma'am, we do have applicant goals for both the Academy and for ROTC. Um, obviously, that doesn't mean they get assessed. Um, and we have seen the number of women going um, increasing due to those applicant goals. Um, but we do have women in almost every skill in the Air Force, with the exception of those we just opened, um, um, our high-end uh, battlefield airmen. And we do targeted recruiting for women across all of our skill sets. Thank you. Mr. Kelly, you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman, and thank each of you witnesses for being here today. Uh, going back just real briefly on, um, on, on what I think um, General Bacon asked or Congressman Bacon asked on, um, on non-deployables, I'm one of those guys who served uh, 31 years in the, in the reserves and done multiple deployments. It bothers me uh, when you're permanently non-deployable. Uh, temporary is a whole different ball game. We need to get those guys back in the fight, guys and girls back in the fight. But these permanently non-deployables, if I play in the NFL and I tear my uh, ACL and I can't run anymore and I don't run a 4-4 anymore, I run a 4-9, I don't still get to play football. And so if you can't go and do the things that you're required by your country, then we need to look for a way to get those guys into the, into the thing. And which leads me to my next point, which is the new blended retirement system. And guys, I'm scared to death of that because uh, in our low density MOSs uh, in, in the Army, and I speak Army speak more than I do the other, uh, but Signal and MI and, and those uh, very tough branches that you have to have high scores to get in, the training is better in the military than you can get in the civilian world, and so there's a, a high pool to get those guys out. And the promotions aren't there necessarily, and the money, and with the blended retirement system, we're going to lose those critical guys, those captains and majors. Uh, we're going to lose those e E6s and E7s at the peak of their career. I'm wondering, what are we doing now to address that uh, 12 to 14-year soldier, air airman, what are we doing now to address that, to make sure that we don't get a huge retention problem 12 years from now? Well, from the Army standpoint, we're, we're moving from an industrial age personnel management system to what I would call a talent management system. And, and sir, your point is well taken. It, it used to be if you, you got someone past 10 years, you, own, you basically had them for 20. Um, I find even today with the young men and women, they're incredibly talented, but having three that are in the service right now, they're millennials and they look at things differently than we need to. They want their talent managers. They want us to respect what their knowledge, skills, or ability, and we can't treat them, you know, kind of like, like round pegs and expect them to go through their careers. So we're gonna have to manage their talents. We don't know yet what the blended retirement system's gonna do, but there are some opportunities here. There's opportunities the way the system's done that we can give critical bonuses at the eight to 12 year. There's things that we have to do in the system that are getting the folks in the right job at the right place so they want to stay. When we look at cyber, um, the MOS, 
if we can incentivize them right, they will stay because they get to do things in the Army that they can't do in the civilian world. And, and as you all understand, there's some incredible things that they get to do serving their country. We just have to compensate them so the families will stay. Yes, sir, if y'all would, because I have one more question I want to get to, so if you can be quick, I'd like to hear from all of you real quick. Yes, sir, from the Navy standpoint, uh, uh, similar approach uh, with our Sailor 2025. It is about providing that uh, flexibility in those career choices. But uh, again, I think the flexibility you gave us in the 2017 NDAA to uh, control the timing of that continuation pay, and then as we uh, adjust our uh, selective reenlistment bonuses around that, uh, I think we're going to have the latitude we need to, to, to be able to control the retention behavior we need. Sir, it's incumbent on us to give our Marines good training so they can make the choice, that opt-in choice, and decide whether they want to remain in the legacy system or go to the BRS. And then I, I concur with you. We don't know what the retention behavior will be with the BRS. I believe it, it's going to, we're going to have to be agile in that continuation pay um, and have a modern system that people want to stay in. And then my final question, and just real briefly, I really want you to think about it, and if one of you has a chance to answer, but I really want you to think about this. In World War II, a lot of guys joined, and they were airborne because they got that $50 jump pay. I mean, it made a big difference. We still give jump pay and jump status and those things, and we have that. We really need to look at uh, at our legacy soldiers, whether they're in cyber and incentives, uh, that, to be in the, to make those special. You know, being airborne is special, and being air assault is special. We need to do that with some of these low density MOSs so that they're special and there's incentives. And then the other thing is those low density MOSs, sometimes the promotion opportunities aren't there. And that probably applies across the Marine Corps and everywhere else. And, you know, we used to have like the spec sevens and spec eights. They're not necessarily going to be leadership guys because they like doing the stuff that they do. I mean, a guy who flies an airplane wants to fly an airplane. He doesn't want to do some other things. And a guy who is in a signal unit or communications or cyber doesn't want to go command a company or a platoon what he wants to do. So we really have to look at ways to uh, incentivize them to stay by the pay. Would you, are y'all looking at those kind of things? Yes, sir, absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back, but thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Uh, Ms. Rosen, you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you. I want to thank uh, Ranking Member and uh, everyone here for their uh, uh, testimony today. I want to build a little bit on that, uh, especially in the areas of STEM. I've been working on some STEM Opportunities Acts. And so as you talk about the changing military and you talk about retention and the millennials and what you have to do to get people in linguistics and cyber, I'm a computer programmer myself by trade, you're going to have to be, you talk about deployables. They're deployed in a different way than, than maybe somebody who is um, flying or, or, or going into another space. So maybe they're deployed in a computer center. They're, they're deployed operating drones. So how are you going to address some of these changes where people are actually really deployed here at home, maybe more of a desk job, maybe more of an uh, intellectual job, and what are you doing in our high schools and universities to try to get these linguistics, cryptologists, computer programmers, and the like? Anyone can start. That's fine. Ma'am, <clears throat> just to break up the... The, the yeah, movement, huh? that's right. You don't always let him go first. That's no, I, I, uh, the, uh, there is a pursuit for STEM, but both on the civilian side and on the military side. Um, uh, those individuals who can, uh, who can come in and, and, and produce for the service. Uh, but first and foremost, we produce Marines. And while the cyber, the cyber force, as it is, is, is beginning to grow, uh, we initially went after this as a lateral move. So we Marines who came in, proved their, capa their capability leadership skills, then move over and get additional training. We have recognized with the growth of that force that we'll have to go into initial accessions as well. And so the challenge is, what is it that makes up that young man or woman who wants to be a cyber Marine, and what are the skill sets that we're looking for? What's their innate ability? Uh, and what would indicate to us. So we're looking at testing regimens um, to, to see whether or not we can help, help ourselves qualify. Um, those, higher, those higher skill MOSs on the enlisted side, we do that by seeking those that, that get good line scores within the ASVAB, et cetera. So 
uh, we've been very interested in, in the whole STEM. How do you pursue that? Um, there are a number of different um, activities at the services. I, I went to an Air Force sponsored um, cyber thing for high school. It was fascinating. Those kids were doing pretty amazing stuff. And I said we should send people to the next one so we can start stealing from the Air Force because they were, they were putting up a really good thing. But uh, those those young men and women are important to us, and uh, and we're working recognizing that and expanding our our ability to reach out to them. On the uh, recruiting front, though, you you do have to plant the seeds early, so you have to get in even at the middle school level, and you have to go to science fairs, and you have to even sponsor those things. We do things similar to what the Air Force does, and we have. Uh, displays and science fair types of activities to do even hackathons and things like they, uh, uh, General Balakis was talking about and, and just spark the interest and you know maybe at some point down the road they'll associate that interest with the Navy and come back and talk to us. Uh, so you have to plant, plant that seed corn and, and get that conversation going. In terms of how do you prepare that workforce then to you know to work at, at, a, at a desk job uh, that's it's actually uh, easier so uh, you because know, your, your and, talent and it, in some of these right. may be people who don't necessarily see themselves as a certain type of military man or woman because they have uh, maybe been in science or or doing other things where they they may not physically see themselves or emotionally see themselves in that way but they have the talent to do these kinds of things which we need the cyber iron dome right Right. Sorry, go ahead. You just yeah. have to get them interested in the topic and then and then show them the rest of the story, the, the what it looks like when they get there, which right. may not be the you know, the, the World War Two movie of right. the military. Right. Well, we're, we're actively recruiting uh, STEM um, students, and, and we've done that in our ROTC, where if you want to get an ROTC scholarship, there's a certain requirement. And it's really a shift. For a while there, we, I think we got away from that. When we came in, you took engineering. You went to West Point. It was primarily an engineering school. If you got a master's, you got it in engineering, and we kind of shifted. But we're coming back, and we're coming back in, in, in a pretty good percentage because we need that foundation for, for a lot of these future-type skill sets. So yeah. uh, we've done things where you know hack the army where we're going out to some you know and our cyber folks are really getting out there and again a, a lot of the young men and women are really excited about these opportunities to use those skill sets and, e and even in the army you can serve it you still can serve the department of the army civilian if you cannot meet the physical standards and right. still serve your country so we're offer operating we're offering multiple ways for people to serve the stem thank you Ma'am, I would just add that the mission sells itself, and really a lot of it is us getting the word out that we have these tremendous opportunities, because I think I agree with you that people don't understand that there's tremendous opportunity for STEM and cyber within the United States military. Um, so we find we go to, I go to a lot of mentoring events and a lot of job fairs um, and, and talk to women and men about the opportunities, because they just don't know they exist. But then the mission, this is what they want to do. Right. And as someone pointed out, there's some things you can only do in the United States military. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. Mr. Russell, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank each of you not only for what you do, but for being here today. Uh, Op-tempo uh, deployment to, to dwell ratios, could you all speak to that uh, a little bit? Uh, yes, sir. Um, you know, many have thought the, the, the dwell time has gone down because the, the troop levels have reduced in, in Afghanistan and Iraq, and, and, and that's really not the case. Um, you know, we're, we're rotating forces right now into Korea. We're rotating forces into Kuwait. We're rotating uh, forces into Europe along with uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. So the dwell time has not come down. And, you know, the, uh, the way we're trying to get after that is and you're all helped with, with growing the Army by having uh, soldiers available to conduct these task missions is, is helping us try to get that dwell time. Is down. it a one to two ratio? Or what it's are we looking a, at? In there? some cases, it's below that. Really? Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Admiral Burke. Sir, uh, just to paint a picture, you know, pre-9-11, Navy had uh, about 421 ships. At any given day, we had 100 ships deployed. Today, we have uh, about 274 ships on any given day. We have 100 ships deployed. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've kind of backed down from our d uh, days a few years ago of having nine-month deployments. That's just deployed overseas on mission. Uh, and we've gotten back to uh, more predictable schedules for our sailors. 
Uh, but we're doing that by riding our ships harder and keeping our sailors at, at sea longer. So it has come at, 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 at a cost to our sailors and, and their families. Uh, our sailors are doing it because we've gotten to be more predictable, and as long as we can maintain predictability and uh, some, real, uh, some uh, expectation of what the schedule will be, they're, they're willing to continue to sustain that tempo. Thank you. Chairman Miller. Mr. Russell, thank you. Um, the Marine Corps, like the Navy, is a deployed force, rotationally deployed force, with units heading out to Okinawa, out in, uh, in uh, the CENTCOM AOR, and now the Special Purpose MAGTAFs in Africa and also in the CENTCOM AOR. On top of that, you've got some of the residuals for combat operations, existing RFFs that have gone on and on. So what we found, uh, we, came out of, we came out of combat expecting this depth to dwell holiday, never happened. Um, we have a number of units, and in the aviation community, some units well below one to two. Uh, infantry, our infantry is just below one to two, and so we're coming, we're, we're deploying, we're coming back, and we're immediately going into a training cycle, and a deployment cycle, because you, you deploy to train. And so we are finding uh, that we are really roughing up not only our Marines and their families, but the gear doesn't have enough time to be reset. Uh, the training is being rushed before you go to the deployment, and while we are meeting our deployed requirements, the ready bench is a little bit ragged. The next deployer are okay, those the rest, it's a bit of a challenge. Um, sustaining this over time is going to be difficult, and uh, but the 185, the additional 3,000 really just enabled us to maintain warfighting capability and introduce the new information capabilities that Commandant believe are necessary for the current fight and the, and the battlefield of the future. So we still have no, solu no solution right now in meeting all the demands from the COCOMs uh, and also getting our arms around the depth of dwell challenge. General Gross. Uh, you know, we've really never left the Middle East since 1991. So what you find is, depending on the skill set, um, you'll and, and our high demand, low density, they do have um, much shorter, some one to one, some one to two. Um, but I would say that's a small number of skill sets. What we find though is that even on a normal um, rotation, what's happening when you come home to get back up to speed in all of your mission sets, you're not home when you're home. And so something that we're spending a lot of time looking at is the the time when people are at home. How do we give them more time? How do we give them more white space to spend that time? Um, Re regrouping and, and gr growing end strength will also help us um, tackle some of that ops tempo. Yeah, and, I, and I think, you know, one of the factors, too, that you look at uh, on returning units is uh, about a third of your warriors will leave uh, just uh, at the end of their enlistments uh, or in uh, attrition. And then uh, of those that you have, you, you're integrating a, uh, a new batch, and then you have non-commissioned officers and officers that you got to get to uh, to the training. Uh, so that they can improve their skill sets in, in the meantime doing all of the refit reorganization uh, and, I, and I don't think that's often uh, appreciated enough you know so that's why I asked the question uh, I like you uh, share great concerns over the blended retirement system I think that it makes us very vulnerable it'll be interesting to see in uh, fiscal year 18 who opts for old versus new uh, I'm not sure we've got a a solution there and then uh, the last concern mr. chairman uh, just comment uh, our continued cutting of incentives uh, BAH now on post uh, we're making soldiers pay uh, living on post BAH shortfalls it was Congress that screwed that up um, so I the more incentives we cut the old adage nothing is too good for the troops and nothing is what we'll give them uh, we, we've got to turn that around so thank you mr. chairman you'll back thank you mr. Russell uh, Dr. Winstrup, you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you all for being here today. I appreciate it. So we've had really good conversation today and the balance that you try to have with recruitment, retention, the quality of troops that you bring in, the opportunities that you offer someone who's joining the military, uh, and the opportunities that they may have when they leave the military. Uh, those are all components that go into someone making up their mind to serve, uh, whether it's four years or for 20 years. Uh, I know when I hit about 12, I decided I was going to go for 20, and uh, that, that made the most sense. And then the other thing that was discussed today, too, is, is what are our numbers look like compared to the requirements of, of each branch and of the military, the downtime, all these things that you have to you know, be considering and balancing all the time. Uh, to meet the current expectations and needs and hopefully the future expectations and needs uh, of our military. And, and I just would love to hear what we consider to be 
a couple of the greatest challenges you have in blending all of those things together as you look to the future, as you, as you look to, well, not only today, but if you look 10 years down the road, the world we're living in today, and more so, what can Congress do to help you in that challenging mission? And uh, we'll start on the other end and go, go the other way. <laughs> So, sir, I would say that what you can do to help us the most is, is stable funding over an extended period of time. Because the ups and downs, especially from a military manpower perspective, um, are impossible. If you just look at the, we've been we've been decreasing since 1991 and took a hard right up. Um, and even on our civilian workforce, it's very, very difficult to manage a stable human capital strategy. Sir, I'll echo uh, General Grosso's comment with respect to funding. Um, Extended CRs, uh, short periods of time to, to spend additional cash, not doing it responsibly, et cetera, is really a challenge for, for all of us. Um, what our Marines expect, they expect good training, they expect good weapons, and they expect a, a good mission. I, I would echo the uh, stable funding comment. We have, uh, you know, the last four or five years, you know, kind of jump changes and end strength for a number of different reasons that cause us to do uh, somewhat unnatural uh, acts to, to, to meet those uh, uh, demands. But then the other thing that happens uh, is uh, sometimes our manpower uh, overhead accounts, the things like the uh, individual's accounts and the transient's accounts uh, are attractive targets to meet top line numbers. And even though you may have enough uh, in your accounts to pay for the bodies. If you don't have enough to cover the overhead to have people in training, you really can't keep the total number of bodies in there. Over the last four years, what that's translated to for the Navy is an increasing number of gaps at sea. Today I'm at about 7,000 gaps at sea uh, in my forward deployed ships, and that, that's been cascading over the last four years. And uh, you know, every year we've looked to program our way out of that, and it's, it just becomes an attractive target. So you have to properly uh, fund the, the overhead accounts uh, as well as the, the total uh, end strength. Um, and then uh, I think, uh, you know, the continued support that, that you've given us in uh, the, uh, the, the, the flexibility to, to, to help us, uh, you know, all of us are doing some form of modernization of our, our personnel system, and we've appreciated the flexibility that you've given us as we look at that, because we all need to t continue to take a look at that. We Thank appreciate you. that. Thank you. Since, since um, timely and predictable fund has already, already been covered, I, I'd just like to mention is the, the qualifications of American youth, and right before President Kennedy took office, he wrote a paper lamenting the fact that only 50 percent of Americans were qualified to basically serve in the military. We wish it was that today, and it's 25 percent, and, you know, as we go in the future, we're going to have to take a hard look at, at, at the ability to get these extraordinary young men and women to serve. We're going to have to be very innovative to bring those uh, qualified folks in the, and, and recruiting, even though we make it, at least for the Army, is, is a tough mission, and we got we got to work that every single day. Well, we could probably have another whole hearing just on um, the reasons for 50 percent down to 25 percent. Uh, and uh, maybe we need to do that at some point. But I, I appreciate it, and it's, um, I also uh, noticed some unanimity there on the stable funding, and I think everyone here recognizes uh, that need, and uh, I hope that we uh, address that as we move forward. Thank you. I've got um, sort of uh, four questions uh, related to his sessions, and if you could go through them very quickly, because we've limited in time. Um, one is, what is your attrition rate during the first enlistment through administrative or uh, adverse uh, uh, separation? Uh, two, um, have you developed better screening tools uh, in terms of uh, recruiting uh, to uh, you know, not take those people in or, or a certain profile of individuals that you could, you could uh, uh, in terms of recruiting? That, that you've learned not to take uh, through some kind of measure. Um, why is it that we're getting on the MEP, in MEP side, why do we have a gap between people that are accepted, phys deemed physically qualified, sent to 
uh, recruit training and then not deem physically qualified and sent back home at taxpayers' expense, you know, it's expensive. And why do we have that gap? And then how, I want to know how many personnel that you have totally engaged in recruiting, not just line recruiters, but support staff and, and command staff uh, as well. Who's ready to go with that? I'm ready to go. Yes, uh, Lieutenant General McConville. 28% uh, attrition. Uh, In the first tour of duty? Yes, sir. 28%? That's down from 35%. Wow. Yes, sir. And then um, as far as screening, we have two, th two things in place. Uh, I, don't, I don't mean in terms of re-enlistment. I just mean no, that, I'm, uh, administrative I'm, I'm, or I'm, adverse selection. I'm talking people because of misconduct, uh, physical wow. injuries do not finish the first term. I'm very surprised. Okay. It was running about 35%. Wow. And it's, so it's coming down and we're working that. And that's why we put a lot of things in, in, in place. And, and you talked about screening. We, we put an occupational physical assessment test okay. in place. We have a TAPAS test. We're trying to get the right psychological fit. And we're okay. doing longitudinal studies to allow us to, to bring okay. those numbers down. Okay. Okay. Then, uh, uh, okay. So then uh, uh, why the disparity in the, in the physicals? In, 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 I, I don't, that's something we need to, I, I need to take that for the record. Please do. We, we, we know that happens, uh, okay. but we, we haven't been able to, you know. Do you know how many total personnel you have oh, 12, uh, 000, in recruiting? About 12,000. I'll get you for the record, but it's about 12,000 with staff and recruiters. Okay. Uh, Vice Admiral Burke, uh, your attrition rate first tour of duty? Is uh, around 15%, about 12% in boot camp, three, three thereafter. Uh, okay. And... Uh, we are looking at some, we have screening uh, tests in, in place. We're looking at some additional ones for destructive behavior okay. profiling that we're piloting right now. The uh, MEPS versus uh, our service screening, uh, we are, we think we have a problem within our own Navy medical community that we're looking to close the loop, that we're being unnecessarily okay. conservative. Uh, and uh, we're continuing to work that. Uh, I have to come back to you on the exact numbers, but I think we're around 5,000 total. That about 3,000 recruiters and about 2,000 additional. Okay. General Brilakis. Mr. Chairman, uh, non-NUS attrition uh, can be folded in a number of different ways, but the short answer is less than 10 percent. Less than 9 percent. Less, less than nine. Less than 10. Nine. 10. Nine percent. During the whole first term. Okay. Uh, well, during the whole first term. First enlistment. Year over year, I can't. I, I'll take that for the record. We'll okay, but is 9% in, in boot camp recruit then training? Our, our non-EAS attrition annually is less than 10%. Our, EA, our attrition in, well. I'm we, just concerned about the, fir, the, in, in the first en enlistment. First enlistment. That's all. I've got to get you that answer. Okay. Yes, sir. General Gros Grosso. Uh, I don't have first enlistment, but I do know 6% is our, our basic training. Wow. So I will get you that for the first enlistment. Okay. Uh, um, you want me to follow up the rest of those? Uh, yeah, well, how about um, very quickly, uh, MEPS, why, why is there a disparity? So the screening tools, recruiters are the best screener tool we have. The process is probably the best. But on the health uh, side? On uh, the health side, the MEPCOM, I'd have to look at any, a particular specific. I can't. I know that we had a case, we had a situation at one point where we had um, problems with the calibration of the, uh, the, hearing, the hearing test at some of the MEPs, and it wasn't translating. Uh, that I know has been taken care of. We also had an issue in Colorado with uh, lordosis, which I don't want to get into explanation sure. of what that condition is, but we got that fixed through okay. uh, working through the process. We have 5,300 Marines involved in recruiting. 5,300? Yes, sir. And that's support personnel, staff? So the headquarters, uh, production recruiters, non-production recruiters, that's it. Okay, thank you. We have 2,300 people in our recruiting infrastructure, um, and we are working on better screening tools, and I will have to take for the record the MEPS question. Okay. Okay. Um, this is all really helpful. It's interesting that the Marines have 5,300 in recruiting and yet 182,000 um, in the Marine Corps. Air Force has half as many recruiting and has 317,000. Do you want to address that, General? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, this year, we will have 38,000 enlisted non-prior service sessions. As I mentioned, we're a young force. Two-thirds of the forces in the operating, uh, the operating forces, every four years we turn over 75% of each cohort. I had the second largest recruiting mission of all the armed forces. Because there's such a high turnover, is that That's what you're correct. saying? That's correct, yes, ma'am. And it, so we need to look at why. Because we're an inexpensive and we're a young force. 
the model that was created because I, I can only put so oh, maybe many first-term Marines into the career force because there isn't that much Got of it. a career force. Got it. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask you to provide this to us for the record. So I'd like for you to, to each uh, provide us with how you spend your advertising budget. Um, you know, TV, sponsor of events, um, and the like. Um, General Grosso, in, in particular, I was at a um, Michigan uh, game not so long ago in which they had, um, they had um, Air, Air Force planes flying overhead and then had them skydive into the stadium, which was exciting to watch, but I couldn't help but sit there thinking, how much is this costing us? Um, so if all of you would provide that, that would be helpful. Uh, in terms uh, of the Navy, Admiral Burt, the anticipation of having 355 ships would be a huge increase in personnel. Uh, what are you doing uh, to, in contemplating that? What trade-offs will the Navy be prepared to make to meet that financial commitment? Well, in terms of the, um, the, the manpower increases, the, the exact number will depend on, you know, what the makeup of that new force contract exactly would look like. So the answer is, you know, it, it depends. Um, uh, you know, that's obviously well, still being do, discussed. If we, if we add these ships, have you done an analysis of how many additional sailors and civilians you'll need? We, we've done uh, bounding analyses. Again, uh, you know, the discussions are, uh, you know, anywhere between 12 to 14 carrier strike groups and then the composition of those. Uh, and, and then we think that that, that, that that force is also needs to be a mix of, uh, a mix of manned and unmanned uh, vessels as well. So that could also reduce the, man, the manpower increase. But we're very much looking at that. The, uh, uh, and then the time frame and the the speed at which we build those vessels. So uh, the answer is it depends. But the you know anywhere from twenty to to forty thousand additional sailors, depending on how we bound it. Um, the infrastructure that we have in place in terms of our recruit training command is is sufficient. You know, given ship building timelines to put uh, enough sailors through there, we would have to ramp up additional drill, uh, you know, recruit division commanders, and uh, perhaps additional uh, training capacity, but probably not additional infrastructure is, is where we are with that right now, ma'am. Okay. Uh, we, we spent some time acting, asking the question uh, where your retention um, areas were, and, and many of you reference um, cyber and intelligence in particular. I, I wonder to what extent those functions should be filled by civilians and the focus be placed there with the expectation that if you're putting someone in the military in those positions, they're so attractive to companies outside that, that you're going to have them moving through there very quickly and constantly in a retraining um, mode. That's just a, an aside. It appears that the, the number one issue here is retention or attrition, depending how you look at it, I guess, in some respects. If you have a high attrition rate, then the costs of retraining are significant. So you want to reduce the attrition rate is, is where we want to go, correct? So I'd be interested in knowing what other, and I'm running out of time, so maybe for the record as well, uh, what other programs, policies we should contemplate to uh, address the attrition rate and find ways to reduce it. Not without yield back, Mr. Chairman. Do you want to go ahead and finish your? You just one very quick point. Um, I think we're still locked into the promotion structure of, I think, the height of Iraq and Afghanistan. And our, is a promotion system too fast? Uh, when the ranking member talked about retention and the cost of training, uh, the fact that it seems to be very competitive in a lot of career fields to stay in, uh, are we forcing good pe people out that should otherwise stay in 
by virtue of our promotion system. Does anybody like to answer that? Uh, sir, I'd yeah. like to take that one for the question. I, I think we do. Uh, 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 we are very much uh, taking a look at, you know, from a sustainability standpoint, we, we have a very broad personnel pyramid, very large at the base, that still very much assumes we can bring people in in large volume and inexpensively. So a lot of our seller 2025 programs are aimed at narrowing the base of the pyramid, making it a little taller, so longer careers, and perhaps allowing more opportunities to repurpose the career, uh, let people change their specialties throughout a career. We can relatively easily do that on the enlisted side with the authorities that we have, and we're doing that on, in Sailor 2025. A little harder to do that on the officer side uh, uh, without some additional uh, policy relaxations, and, uh, and we're working uh, with your teams to, to explore those opportunities. Anybody else? Okay. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. It, it, the way our model works with the pyramid in, in, in law is only 10% of enlisted soldiers really can make it to 20 years and 30% of officers serve a, a full career. That's kind of how the model works. And this has been ex especially exacerbated during the drawdown when we took went from 570,000 soldiers on the way to 460,000. So almost 100,000 soldiers you know, either tritted or, or were asked to leave that may have been fully qualified from the Army over the last five years. Anybody else? Yes. On the enlisted side, we allow people to stay that haven't been promoted. So I shared that with you. I mean, that yeah. the first commander. On the officer side, we've for the longest time to major, we've had an, a 95% promotion rate. So I, I, I wouldn't make the argument that we're losing talent because of the promotion system. Sir, we promote the vacancy. We've got a lot of platoon leaders. We have a lot of squad leaders and a lot of Marines. They move their way up, and I have fewer spots for folks as we go. So the upper route system, the way we do business, makes it very competitive, allows us to get to, to find the talent, and we have, we've got processes in place where individuals that have devoted uh, a good chunk of their life to service are allowed to be continued to, to 20 years, staff sergeants and majors. Okay. Um, Mr. Fear, anything else? Uh, I wish to thank the witnesses for their enlightening testimony this afternoon. There being no further business, the subcommittee stands adjourned.